listening to the GM Shuffle with Michael Lombardi, presented by DraftKings and v Here is Femi Abebefe. Welcome to another edition of the GM Shuffle with Michael Lombardi, presented by DraftKings and v I'm your host, Femi Abebefe. As always, make sure to subscribe, rate, and review wherever you get your podcasts. Our producer, Elliot Bowman, with us on the ones and twos, as always. And Michael, this is the podcast everyone's been waiting for. The world has been wondering what is going to happen with Justin Fields. Uh, well, over the weekend, while I was oh, out and yeah. about, buddy, I was out and about getting a slice of pizza. My phone is now buzzing 12 times in 30 seconds. I'm like, what the hell is going on? I look up and I see that the Bears have traded Justin Fields to the Pittsburgh Steelers for a 2025 sixth round pick that is a conditional fourth round pick based on playing time. Fields would have to play 51% of snaps or more in 2024, but uh, here's what everyone's been waiting for. Fields now has arrived in Pittsburgh. We've come full circle from the beginning of this quarterback carousel. Yeah. All right. So let's get things on the record here. So when you trade a sixth and 25, that's equivalent to a seventh this year. Now, obviously, if he plays 51%, he'd have to start eight games for them to cash that into a fourth. So they are protected. You know, I think people are sitting there blaming Ryan Poles. I mean, Ryan Poles can't control the tape. Ryan Poles tried to control the narrative. He did a good job of putting it out there that there was a one available. Remember at Super Bowl and everybody's jaw dropped? Right, And then it came to a two, and then it went into the Alex Smith trade with Kansas City to San Francisco, from San Francisco to Kansas City. But as much as he tried to stir the narrative, you know, and he's sitting there saying, well, we haven't really explored any trade options, you know. Well, what have you been doing? You know, like, what have you been doing? Well, we're looking over the quarter. We haven't finished, finalized the quarterback. He tried. He tried everything in his power to create a, an illusionary market that wasn't there. And as much as media and as much as Twitter wants to stand behind it, the tape doesn't lie. And that's always the case about the National Football League. It's a humbling league. It defines you as a player. It tells you what you are as a player. It tells you what you are as a executive in terms of did you fix the team correctly. And so you can't deny it. I mean, they, got, they traded them for basically, you know, change in the couch. You know, that loose change you find in your couch when you move. I mean, that's what they did. And for Pittsburgh, I don't think this is a remodel. This is a teardown. You know, Mm -hmm. they tore down their whole quarterback room. They got rid of Canada. They got rid of of, of, uh, Pickett. Pickett, You know, they got rid of MVP Mitch. Mm -hmm. You know, they got Mason Rudolph. They didn't even try to resign. I thought they might try to resign Mason Rudolph. They got rid of him. And now they revamp it with Russell Wilson moving forward. So... This was a, for a team that was not saying they were unhappy with their quarterback, extremely unhappy with their quarterback. Yeah, and I think it's important to note what you just said there, that Russell Wilson moving forward, because I think when the trade happened Saturday afternoon, everyone said, oh, there could be a competition between Fields and Russ throughout the offseason. Mike Tomlin went ahead and squashed all of that. They're talking to some of the reporters or some of the sources out of Pittsburgh saying, hey, Russ is the starter. This is Russell Wilson's job. And Russell Wilson, based on the reaction from Kenny Pickett, was pretty much given assurances that he is the leader in the clubhouse and he is the QB1 for the Steelers. Yeah, that that was surprising to me because I thought Pittsburgh – would stand behind Pickett a little bit more and, you know, and try to see if they could get him to compete. As I said on the pod, if Pickett can't beat out Wilson, then he's not an NFL quarterback. And Pickett, I mean, he ran for the hills. I mean, you talk about a non-competitor. Jesus Christ. I mean, you know, I, I want to be traded. Like, seriously? You know, where's your competition? And it lends credibility to that story that, you know, he didn't want to dress. I, I kind of dismissed that story as kind of a, a bad narrative out there. Mm-hmm. But the way Pickett behaved based on the way he's played in his career in Pittsburgh, you know, where is your, where's your competitive fiber? Where, where are you going? You're the leader of a team. Where are you going? You don't want to compete? Bring it on, you know? But, I mean, obviously Pittsburgh admitted the mistake. They moved on. And, look, th- this is going to be a new team for Pittsburgh. And I think for Tomlin, you know, Tomlin's sitting there saying, look, Russell's thrown 19 interceptions over the last two seasons, right? Mm -hmm. So it isn't like this guy throws, you know, the ball, makes bad decisions. Now, you know, we know that he's fumbled a little bit and he causes some concern. And we also know that the offense that you have to run for all the Russ let's cut, let them cook is really a, it's best when you can run the football with Russ. So it gives them a chance that if they can play good defense, don't turn the ball over. You know, they won 10 games last year. I don't know how they win 10, more than 10 with Russell, 
But the fact that they won 10 without a quarterback is remarkable. Yeah, I mean, they, they're able to make magic every year in Pittsburgh. Mike Tomlin's never been under 500 in his career. And two things here for me. The first one, I guess for those of you who smashed the over on the over one and a half for Russell Wilson, Fields, Kirk Cousins to be starting week one, you can go ahead and cash that over ticket there with Russell Wilson in line to be the starter for the Pittsburgh Steelers. Cousins, of course, in Atlanta. Second thing here, as somebody who was a believer in Justin Fields, and I've cooled off a little bit after what we saw in the 2023 season, why do you think the delta exists between what the NFL thinks of Fields and what the media and Twitter thinks of Justin Fields? Like, it, it, why was there such a wide gap in the two perceptions there? I think it just shows you what a wide gap there is to people that understand what goes on on the field on Sunday and people that think they know. And it goes to the commentators as well, the people that are in charge of educating the game to us, right? You know, like they're sitting there evaluating the quarterback. They're sitting there believing that it's progressive reads when a lot of times it's not. You know, they're talking about coverage that's not even existence. And I, 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 this isn't an arrogant statement, but too many people don't know when they start talking about the player. And you got to watch the guy. And you, you have to watch and understand what they're asking him to do. Everybody wants to blame Getsy. Everybody wants to blame, oh, he's had poor coaching in Chicago. Well, you know, C.J. Stroud comes in the league and takes over. Lamar Jackson comes in the league and takes over. You know, guys come in the league and play well. You know, it's just by nature. Fields had a, had a tough delivery. His arm, his mechanics coming out of college were not good. And his ability to control the football was horrible. Now, is he a great athlete? Yeah, he can run the ball. But the, the, the fact when you have to throw it, he's got to make throws and make the decisions of the throws, not happening. So... I just think, to me, it's more of a, of a commentary on the, the lack of knowledge between what people that know. I mean, you know, people think he's going to be the MVP, and then those same people think they're going to become the fucking an offensive coordinator in the league tomorrow. Like, seriously? Like, do you understand how hard it is to be an OC in the National Football League with no experience? Do you understand that? Like, you can't go. I mean, I would love to ask uh, Brian Greasy what his experience was, what he thought he knew when he was doing college games to now that he's worked three years as the 49er quarterback coach. Mm -hmm. Like, I think that pro he would probably say, whoa, you know, this is a completely different world than I thought I lived in. And that's the world we're dealing with. These people that get on Twitter and start doing clinics, the clinics are half wrong about what's going on on the tape. They're not even close. It's, it's misinformation upon misinformation. It's the starting point is wrong. You know, it's the starting point's wrong and the theory's wrong. To push this kid as an MVP candidate when you're watching the tape is absurd. It was really absurd. And for people to still think he was poorly coached in Chicago and Chicago should have kept him, you're not watching the game the right way. You have no clue. I mean, the league clearly told you. They told Ryan Poles, either you draft a quarterback or you're never going to win. But don't you think and this could get traded for essentially a seventh mm -hmm. round pick in this year's draft? Because remember, now, if you want to get a seventh round pick on the, on the Saturday of this year's draft, if you want a seventh round pick, you have to trade next year's six to get it, which is what they did. But don't you think this Delta is a little bit more unique with Fields? Because like, I think I, I get what you're saying that like people in the league obviously have a lot more experience than those of us on the outside. But for the most part, like if you pull the average fan, what are they going to say about Patrick Mahomes? It's going to line up with what people think in the league. What are they going to say about Kirk Cousins? It's likely going to line up with what people think in the league. This one is so far off to where it's like, I, it's, I, don't, I don't know if it goes back to college or what, or maybe the draft process that maybe we all thought that Fields was going to be good and we're just clinging to the pre-draft, uh, I guess, or evaluations or whatever but this one feels so unique to where the league said, hey, he's worth pretty much a seventh round pick and everyone else is saying, hey, this guy can be the MVP. And like, that's not a made up statement. Like there's analysts that said that and that we all are in the betting world now, like the bet splits last year heading into the season said that as well. People were betting Justin Fields he was as 20 to one to win most valuable player in the league. Like there's just such a wild gap that this one feels a little bit more unique than the typical, okay, like people outside don't know as much as the people who work in the league. Yeah, I, I can't. I mean, I don't know if it's the, the analytics that behind the, what people see in the analytics, because even when you look at the analytics, Fields' numbers on analytics doesn't shine. No. So I don't know where he gets his support from. I really don't. I mean, you know, the analytics back up the people that think he can't play. You know, the analytics in terms of just he's thrown for a Femi. He's had one 300 career passing day. One. You know, he's mm -hmm. had eight 250 career passing days in his career. 
you know, he's had more non 100 yard passing days than he's actually had, than he's actually had, oh, you know, excuse me, he's had five under 250. He's had eight games under 100. He's had 26 career games of under 200 yards passing. 26. Now, they said everything was going to be okay when they got Clay Capel. They said everything was going to be okay when they got D.J. Moore. His numbers went down in terms of yards per attempt this year from last year with D.J. Moore. You know, he averages seven yards per attempt. I mean, so, like, nobody wants to look at it. And then you start going into the fumbles and the turnovers, which Caleb Williams, too, when you study him on college tape, there's a lot of times where he's loose with the ball in the pocket. He lets it get out. Now, he's got better ability to make plays. And when he plays with when he plays with posture and poise within the pocket and climbs the ladder, he's dynamic. But there are times where he has moments where he's loose with the ball, takes too many chances with the second look. But his play and the rewards that you gain from his overall play are far greater than anything Fields could do. It's not close. It's really not close. And this isn't I've got some grunge match against, you know, the Bears or, or feel. This is just the reality. Look, if you're Ryan Pace and you're sitting in your office in Atlanta today, you basically, as the general manager of the Bears, you traded high commodity draft picks for two quarterbacks and you struck out both times. You, you at some point have to say, I need to reevaluate how I evaluate quarterbacks. Yeah. Last note there, our producer Elliot just sent me this. Last season, Fields had 10% of all MVP bets over at DraftKings entering the season with 20 to 1 odds. The only player who had a higher percentage of bets was Jalen Hurts at 16%. So, like, this is not a made up narrative of uh, you talking about Fields being MVP. Like, this was a real thing that was discussed but it was the same thing last with, year. How did Mitch Trubisky get his nickname? How did I start calling him MVP Mitch? It was the bets. I mean, it's the same thing. People were paying, people were going to the window to pay him. Yeah, I mean, Bears fans love their team, and they'll back it with their money. So I, I give them that kind of credit. But uh, in that regard, it didn't really work out for Justin Fields. Now he's on the Pittsburgh Steelers. I do want to talk more about the Bears side of this thing, because what you said about Caleb Williams, I think is really interesting. He is a prohibitive odds-on favorite to be the number one overall pick, which is held by the Chicago Bears. Now minus 3,000 in that range. What's his setup like? We'll discuss it all next here on the GM Shuffle. You're listening to the GM Shuffle with Michael Lombardi, presented by DraftKings and v Here is Femi Abebefe. You know, it's interesting. You brought up the analytics really do not like Justin Fields, and that's a fact based on all the numbers that you look at. Uh, With that said, I just saw this tweet from John Ledyard there, who uh, covers the Pittsburgh Steelers for Blue Wire podcast. He said that the highest rated game in per football focuses database for Justin Fields was the 2021 game when they played the Steelers on Monday Night Football. He had a 90.5 grade, five big time throws according to PFF, zero turnover where he plays, ran for 45, threw for 291. So that's like one of the, the few games in his career where you could point to say, okay, he played really well when he was a rookie, but it just has never really met that sort of standard consistently throughout his career, which is why he ultimately has ended up on the Pittsburgh Steelers. Yeah, and now he gets to take a step back. He's the backup to Russell, and, you know, he doesn't have to really – the pressure isn't on him. I think it was really unfair on the kid that everybody put that MVP pressure on, like you mentioned. I mean, there Mm. were so many tickets coming in. But like you said, Bear fans are passionate. They love their team. They're so desperate to get a quarterback. They're so desperate to become relevant again. And the league needs the Bears relevant, right? Yeah. You know, the, the league, the NFL is a better league when Washington's good, when Chicago's good, yep. when the Raiders, Raiders are good, when yep. those historic franchises are good. You know, the league is better. The league shines brighter. And so because the Bears have such great fans, but you can't lie. I mean, you know, I mean, this is two years in a row that I would have never been able to attend the St. Patty's Day Parade <laughs> in Chicago because they, they hated me for what I said about, about fields. I mean, you know, and – now, uh, you know, and then Trubisky, right? Remember, I yeah. couldn't even go to Chicago with Trubisky. Don't come to this town, you know? So it's like, look, you just got to be objective. It's not, you're not trying to hurt anybody. You're just trying to be objective. This is called football analyst. If you want people to tell you what you want to hear, just tune in, tune into, your, you know, to some, you know, somebody who's all hook line. I mean, there's guys out there that still yeah. think Fields is dynamic. I, you know, there's guys out there that think Fields, you know, is a top 10 quarterback in the league. There really are. They're delusional, but they're out there. 
This uh, and to take this for a, with a grain of salt here, based on what we've seen over the past week and some of the reporting. But uh, NFL Network's Ian Rappaport tweeted out yesterday saying that important to note on the Justin Fields trade, at least four additional teams inquired about trading for Fields, but of Fields' course. representation asked for him not to be traded there. He wanted to be with the Steelers, and the Bears did right by Justin. Right. I could have predicted this was coming because they're trying to take some of the heat off of why polls didn't get more. I saw an article this morning. They turned down better offers. Come on, please stop. Stop. They wanted Where to do right they? by Justin. Why didn't they happen? Yeah. Why what, Do right? Be a backup? Be a backup in Pittsburgh? I mean, you know, is that doing right? Come on. This is, this is just part of the narrative to correct another narrative. You look, polls had no market for the guy. And you get traded for a sixth, which is essentially a seventh in the same year. There's no market. Just accept it and move on. Look, you don't have to continue to spin it. Stand in front and say, look, we, we thought we had a market. We thought we could calculate it. And it didn't work out. There's nothing wrong with it. It's not Poles' fault. Poles, Poles, wasn't, Poles was trying to trade him. Poles did everything he could to prop it up. Poles just couldn't hide the tape. Mm-hmm. You know, Paul's just could, you know, back in the day when we were on 16 millimeter tape, you could hide the tape. Well, I can't find that tape. Where's that tape? There, nobody has that tape. Where is it? On video, there's no more hiding the tape. You know, like, you can't hide it. People put the game on. Okay, let me watch this bad boy. You can't hide it. Like, seriously, you can't control. The tape doesn't lie. The eye in the sky, you, it, it's there. If you don't want to accept it, that's part of what you're doing. If you want to buy into the narrative, go ahead. But this notion, well, they turned down a lot. Oh, yeah, they turned down the number one pick because they wanted to do right by. Oh, give me a fuck it. That's not that's not pace. That's not Poles' job is to do right by fields. Poles signed an oath with the Chicago Bears to do right by the Bears. That's what his oath is. That's what his contract says, not to do right by fields. So if he turned down anything of substance that was different, then that's all. Then he is violating the code of trust between his employer and himself which is not what he should do. Yeah. And you know, and, yeah. and to me, this is just all bullshit. It's just all bullshit. Yeah, and, and he didn't do that. Like, 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 say what you will about Ryan Poles. Like, I highly doubt he turned down a much better offer to trade him to Pittsburgh. Like, that's just nonsense uh, as we move look, on. Look, look, he couldn't <laughs> make it up. I mean, just yeah. accept the fact that he couldn't. There's nothing out there. There was nothing out there. If there was something out there, he would have pulled the pin. Now, look, if he pulled one of those Carolina Panthers where we turned down two number ones for Brian Burns that was documented, now come after his ass, right? But he Mm -hmm. didn't. No. He didn't. He was out there. His line was in the water for days. There was no nibbles on it. There was nothing. I mean, I thought the Eagles would have been the perfect place for him. They took Kenny non-competitive picket over him. That's what they did. Think about that. They took Kenny Pickett over him. Luke Getze gave $15 million to Gardner Minshew. Like, like, they gave money. I mean, seriously. The Steelers picked Russell Wilson and said publicly that they extend, extend his contract beyond this year, which I'm sure was music to the ears for the Broncos, but still. I yeah. mean, think about that. The, the, the Steelers are committed to a 35-year-old Russell Wilson who hasn't played well in three seasons, literally, okay? You know, and they're, and they're talking about an extension. Mm. Well, there's a lot of layers that I'm sure we'll be tracking this uh, Steelers quarterback room all throughout the offseason. Russell Wilson, the QB1 in Pittsburgh. Don't let anybody else tell you otherwise until at least further notice when we actually start playing some football games in the fall. On the Chicago Bears side of it, though, we mentioned Caleb Williams. He is the projected pick to the Chicago Bears to be that quarterback for them. They've been proved this roster. Like, I'll give Ryan Poles that. They make the trade for Keenan Allen. They bring him in. You already have DJ Moore there. You signed DeAndre Swift. They made some signings along the offensive line. The defense, maybe they need another edge rusher, but the defense was playing really well post Montez Sweat trade last year. Is this a Bears team that should I guess expect to make the playoffs or at least be in the mix for one of those wild card spots in a pretty tough NFC North? Well, I mean, I think Green Bay's gotten better. I think Minnesota has a chance to get better. I think Minnesota's had one of the better off seasons of anybody, yeah. especially as they position themselves with the two number one picks. They've improved their team. They've improved every position on their team in terms of their cap. They're no longer in Kirk Cousins jail. They can pass the salt at the dinner table now. You know, so they don't have to worry about that any longer. And if they can find a way to get the quarterback that O'Connell wants to build a team around and they're right, they're on their way. But I think if you're Chicago, you're hoping you can have that Houston Texan magic where 
It all comes together for Caleb in the first year. And, you know, all of a sudden everything's better. Look, I love Swift, but I wrote about this for VEASAN today. I was working on this column this morning, and there's just something about the signing that bothers me. Like two teams have turned down Swift. Detroit signs Gibbs. Philly brings Barkley in. Okay, you know, get it. One team went free agency and spent. Another team went draft and spent. But to me, there's something I'm missing on Swift because I think he's really good. Last year, he averaged around 5.5 yards per catch in the passing game. I expect him to be better than that. He's a career 7.2. In Detroit, he was at 7.7. But that number's starting to slide. Is he losing something? I don't know. But they paid $16.2 million for a two-year deal with this kid. And they turned down Montgomery at $6 million last year. Have they gotten better in that area? I, I don't know. I don't know that one, but I'm with you. I think if they if look, their team is going to look a lot better if they get production out of the quarterback position. You yep. know, with Keenan Allen, they're going to be able to convert third downs. Look, nobody drives to the stadium worried about defending Keenan Allen. What you worry about that with Keenan Allen is he's going to beat you for the jump ball. He's going out physically. And he makes great plays. He's got to stay healthy, which has been a little bit of a concern. But he but he had a great year last year. So for me, I, I think that that's clearly you know what they need to do. They, they, you know, they signed Bayard at, at safety. They signed this Ryan Bates to play center for them, which has been a thorn in their side of position. So we'll see. You know, Brett Rippon right now, you know, they're going to have to – where are they going with their backup quarterback? I think that's mm-hmm. the next question to ask. Peterman signed with New Orleans. Can you imagine Nate Peterman still getting backup quarterback jobs? I, Is there a better occupation in life than the backup quarterback? If you could just kind of get on the backup circuit – this is after throwing five interceptions and a half when he was in Buffalo, <laughs> and he's still getting around I mean, the league. Can you get a better? Jobs. Can you? Is it? Is there a better gig? I mean, no. you know, I mean, I'm sure. Uh, Ask Chase Daniel. Zach Wilson saying, "When do I get traded? When do I get traded?" You know. Yeah, <laughs> never. That's what happens. Well, Zach Wilson ain't getting traded. <laughs> yeah. Nobody's taking Zach Wilson off your hands and, and assume, uh, uh, absolve the debt that the Jets put into him. So they're going to have to waive him. That's mm-hmm. going to have to be a waiver wire. Stefan Diggs and the Buffalo Bills. This is getting interesting once again here, Michael. Every so often we have to have the Stefan Diggs conversation. Recently, last week, he had some cryptic tweets on his Twitter account there, tweeted out Friday, ready for whatever. He changed the cover of his Twitter bio to like kind of waving goodbye to Buffalo. Here we go again with this thing with Diggs and the contract's massive and the, what he did in terms of the production dipped down from what we'd seen in 2022 and 2021. Is this kind of a, are we heading towards, I guess, a parting of ways between the Bills and Stefan Diggs? Well, he's available. I mean, it, it's, I mean, I've said that in what, in last week's pod, mm-hmm. I'm getting, we've done so many, I forget, but he's available if you want him. You know, now the Jets are searching for a quarterback. I, Houston, you know, the teams that were involved with, Keenan Allen, the Houston and the Jets, who they thought they had a chance to get him, couldn't. Uh, you know that. You know the Jets probably would Buffalo trade him to the Jets. Maybe what would the Jets pay for him? You know the Jets signed Tyron Smith, who started 30 games over the last what four seasons. Four seasons, yep. You know, and he's he's got back issues. You know, he's had durability issues. Can't practice. Everybody looks at that Jets signing Tyron as saying, oh, well, they got their left tackle. Do they? They do want a piece of paper, but they do they have it on the field? You can't when you can't practice, and you're thirty some years old. It's hard. So you know everybody has them taking a receiver in the draft. But if they could get Diggs, I don't know. I think Buffalo definitely will deliver them. Now where does Buffalo go at receiver? That remains to be seen. Maybe they draft one. But you know Buffalo is going to be a twelve team now. You know they got the two tight ends, and they're you know they let Gabe Davis walk, which I don't think they were worried about. And they'll move on. But I think the Diggs thing is clearly headed for a trade. And what's the value of that trade? Yeah, right now, the Buffalo Bills wide receiver depth chart is Diggs, Khalil Shakir, their slot guy, then Curtis Samuel, who they signed in free agency. And you mentioned Diggs. Like, this is not the easiest trade to make there because, like, right now, if they were to, if they were to release him as a, as a post-June 1 release, they would have $19 million in cap saving, but they would have to split up the dead cap between 2024 and 2025. But if they went ahead and made him a post-June 1 trade, they would have the dead cap of $8.8 million this year, $22.2 million in 2025, then $19 million. So it would be around the same money there for a release or a trade for Stefan Diggs. So they're going to have to eat it eventually on Diggs, but they at least would get some savings if they wanted to trade him uh, this offseason. Yeah, I mean, look, here's the reality. His, you know, he averaged 13.2 a catch two years ago. Last year, he's down to 11-1. And it ain't because the quarterback wasn't good. 
yeah, now the quarterback is great, and uh, the production dipped down just a bit here. All right, that does it for us here on the DraftKings Network. For the podcast audience, we'll be back on the other side. We'll break down some of the next teams for Stefan Diggs. Who might he go to this 2024 offseason? And we'll also get into some of the other NFL news and notes here on the other side. This is the GM Show. Listening to the GM Shuffle with Michael Lombardi, presented by DraftKings and VSIN. Here is Femi Abebefe. So, over at our show sponsor, DraftKings, you can bet on the team where Stefan Diggs will take his first snap of the 2024 season. Right now, the Bills are still the odds on favorites, minus 230. The Cowboys are at 4 to 1 for some reason. The Texans, plus 550. Patriots, Ravens, 12 to 1. Panthers, Cardinals, 18 to 1. Chargers, Chiefs, Giants, at 20 to 1. What do you think is the best fit here for Stefan Diggs if he were to be traded? You know, I, I maybe Houston, you know, with Tank Dell, with uh, Nico Collins, with no, you know, they've got other guys. I, I don't see him being the way his hands have gone a little bit. Eight drops last year, big drop in the Kansas City game, down two yards in yards per attempt. You know, maybe he would be better off more in a, uh, you know, as, as a kind of a, a secondary receiver. I don't mm-hmm. think anybody's sitting there saying, boy, we got to take Diggs out of the game. I mean, receivers that get to 30, it becomes a little bit of a concern on the downward spiral. And one thing I've learned through my career is when your hands start to go, it's because your legs are going. Mm-hmm. You know, we see it more in basketball. But I think to me that would be the place. And, and I, the other thing is the hurdle of the contract, plus dealing with the player. You know, it's hard to tell a player you got to take – you know, you're not the same player. they got great mm-hmm. pride, right? And so if you trade for him and, you know, you're going to take that contract on, I don't know. I mean, I think that's the hard part, right? I think that's the challenging part that you get into. What do we do here? So, you know, I I don't have a landing spot. I think Houston obviously was in the market for Keenan Allen. If you're in the market for Keenan Allen at that cap number, you're probably going to be in the digs market depending on the price. Yeah, no, it's, it's what we talked about yesterday there. It's kind of like what Doug Collins said about coaching in the NBA. You don't really want to coach the aging superstar, and that's sort of where Diggs is at. Like, nobody's saying that he can't play. He's like he's not completely washed. He's still a good player, but he's not really the, the all-pro top five Stephon Diggs. He wasn't that last season, and sometimes a change of scenery is needed for that guy because if he's still going to remain in Buffalo, he's going to see himself as, I'm Stephon Diggs, I'm all-pro wide receiver one, and that really wasn't the case last year. So maybe they can get a deal done there for Buffalo no. and kind of move forward here with Josh Allen and the rest of the offense. I mean, I, Mike Williams is on the tour this week, starting with the Jets. He's going to go mm-hmm. to Carolina and then Pittsburgh. You know, now I think mo- this is more, can Mike Williams stay healthy too? This is Mike, we could make a team of, they look great on the depth chart, but can they actually play? Right, we could make an all-pro team like that. Tyron Smith would be the left tackle, yep. you know, and it all comes back to durability and reliability, right? Mike Williams would be one of the receivers. So I, I think to me, if he's healthy and he can pass a physical, you know, he's going to he's going to get paid because he can make plays down the field. But he's been trending downward too, and he's older than people think he is. So, you know, if he goes somewhere, would it take the out of the digs thing? Yeah, I think so. So. There goes another chair, and I'm sure, you know, uh, the, the the bills are sitting there waiting to see if somebody's going to snap them up. Yeah. You know, I, I don't know. You know, what's the value too? What are you willing to pay? That's a lot of money to, to have on a contract. It's like Odell last year. You paid 17 million for Odell. Did you get your money's worth out of it? Uh, no, you did not. I mean, he he played like how many games in the regular he season? Did. He was he was hurt quite often in the regular season and didn't give them much in the postseason as well. Uh, one guy who gave a lot to the game and uh, as a fan of football, going to miss watching him play each and every week is uh, Aaron Donald, the eight-time All-Pro defensive tackle for the Los Angeles Rams, ten-time Pro Bowl. He made the Pro Bowl every single season he played in the NFL. He's hanging him up. He's calling it quits. He went ahead and announced his retirement in a statement. He said, "Throughout my career, I have given my everything to football, both mentally and." Physically, 365 days a year was dedicated to becoming 
becoming the best possible player I could be. I respected this game like no other, and I'm blessed to be able to conclude my NFL career with the same franchise that drafted me. And uh, every one of those words is 100% true. He was at one point the best player in the NFL, and we're going to miss watching him play there. He's going right into the Hall of Fame, I'm sure, five years from now. Yeah, no, oh, yeah, easy. I mean, you know, this guy is unbelievable. But, you know, it's funny. So you, the, the, what often happens here is when a player retires, right, they have all this signing bonus, and I think he had $8 million. The Rams redid his deal, right? Mm-hmm. So they redid his deal, which probably washed away any of the payment back on the signing bonus for what he's brought to their franchise. But this is one of those where, you know, they're going to take cat, dead cap money this year and into next year. But it's worth it. I mean, the guy is incredible. I mean, it's an incredible player that he was – his ability, what I wrote about in Football Done Right, was his stamina, his ability to play at a high level, play after play after play after play. That's remarkable. This, he never got tired, you know, and I think that ultimately is, you know, his power, his lower body, his, his ability to control the line of scrimmage – I think to me, you know, it's it's it, we're the game's going to miss him because yeah. these are great players. But you know, at 33 years old, I think he said, "Okay, enough is enough. I need to, you know, I got my health. I've accomplished what I wanted to accomplish. I got enough money in the bank, and life goes on." Yeah, he did everything that you could do as an NFL football player, Super Bowl champion, three-time Defensive Player of the Year, member of the All-Decades team, like I said, eight-time All-Pro, ten-time Pro Bowler, Defensive Rookie of the Year. In college, unanimous All-American, his final year in college. Like, everything that you could do as a football player, Aaron Donald did it. And to that, we tip the cap and say congratulations on a hell of a career and enjoy the rest of life, man. We'll miss watching you play, but uh, enjoy the rest of life. And I'm glad that he's walking away happy and healthy Uh, sticking to some of the other news and notes from around the league Jacksonville Jaguars they signed 49ers defensive lineman Eric Armstead three-year deal worth up to 51 million dollars the Jags are building some power forwards on that defensive line between you got Trayvon Walker he's tall and long got Armstead now I mean this this is right up Trent Baalke's alley right here yeah interesting because I I would have preferred to me it me just me personally I wouldn't have signed Duvernay and Davis and Arm said, I would have just given all that money to Wilkins, right? Like, I would have just said, okay, boom, I'm giving you all this money. Not, not that Duvernay was expensive. I think $13 million, what they signed this guy for two years. I don't, you know, I'm, but I would have done that. I would have liked that better. I, I would have liked quality over quantity. But if Armstead's healthy and he can keep going, which we haven't seen him do that. Last year at the end of the year, he was hurt with the knee, how he handles it. Balky drafted him in San Francisco, so he obviously mm-hmm. knows the kid pretty well. But it does strengthen their team, right? You got Josh Allen, you got Walker. Now you get him inside to go with uh, Robert ha- Robertson Harris, who they paid to. I-, I think they're building a better defensive front, which is essentially – but again – the quarterback that remains from that draft class, Trevor Lawrence, he's got he's to raise his level of play. Like that, that's probably the most important thing for Jacksonville's offseason. And it's not because they got Gabe Davis or Duvernay or, you know, all these other players, right? He's got to play better. He's got to make better decisions. He's got to play smarter. He's got to protect the football better. This is a big year for Jacksonville because if they don't win, you know, you can expect some changes down there. There's just no way. And then he goes into his fifth year, which is going to eat ton of cap room. Yeah, potentially. Maybe they signed Trevor Lawrence to a deal this offseason. He's eligible to sign a contract there. And I would imagine that his agent and himself, they want one of those big deals that we saw Herbert and Burrow get last season. But we're going to need a little bit more improved play. They're going to wait and see. They're going to wait and see. They're, they're all waiting to see what Tua does, right? Yeah. They're, they're waiting for the Tua contract to come in. Once the Tua contract comes in, you know, Lawrence is going to be knock, knock, knock. <laughs> you know, here I am. I'm ready. <laughs> I'm ready to sign, guys. I'm ready. <laughs> Just put me one over there. <laughs> uh, the defending Super Bowl champions, they went ahead and picked up Marquise Hollywood Brown. This is a one-year contract worth up to $11 million. I believe it's around $7 million guaranteed, $4 million in incentives. There is the Kansas City Chiefs. They've been looking for some extra wide receiver help to go along with Rasheed Rice. Obviously, Kelsey, the tight end, the Mahomes' favorite target there. But, I mean, solid signing here, getting Hollywood Brown uh, to the Kansas City Chiefs. I mean, it's such a shift in, in the way they think anymore, and I kind of love it, right? Mm-hmm. So for, for so long, their theory was we're going to outscore everybody, and that didn't work, right? And then now they've gone into this, we're just going to we're gonna put our money in the defense. We're going to try to get the offensive line to a certain level, but we're going to try to bottom fish for these receivers and see we got, the great, we got a great, the greatest quarterback in the game today and let him go. 
I, I credit Andy Reid for this shift and, and, and Brett Veach. I mean, this is something that's really good, right? You know, they found out we can't outscore people. we got to play good defense. And they've added a lot of good players to the defense. Now, it'll be interesting to see what happens with Snead, right? You know, Snead is out there. There are a lot of teams that are sniffing around for him. You know, I, I think ultimately there's teams that want to do a deal. I think he's going to have to take a physical to prove he's 100% healthy. This is a little bit of not the J.C. Jackson thing, because remember when J.C. Jackson left New England to go to the Chargers, there was concerns about his knee. He was healthy, mm-hmm. but there were concerns about the longevity of the knee. I think there's some conversation about Snead. I'm not saying he's not healthy, mm. but I think if you're going to put all this money and pay a high draft pick, you want to make sure you're going to get five solid years out of him. And I think that remains to be seen. And is it the teams like Indianapolis and Tennessee? Because that's what I've heard on the Legereus Sneed front. Everyone said, oh, the Colts really like the Legereus Sneed. The Titans might go after him. Are those the teams that you're hearing? Or is there maybe some other suitors that are kind of snooping around the Legereus Sneed well, race? I, I think a lot of this is going to come down to the draft. And what's the compensation? I mean, right now he's counting 19.2 on their cap. They, they've tied up a lot in them. And what they're saying to you is, is we want to pick now. We don't want to wait till we get a compensatory third. Because they're not signing anybody. They're, they would If Snead signs a big contract, they would get a deal back, right? Mm-hmm. But I got a feeling that the, the Chiefs are going to do the smart thing like the Eagles have done, like the Colts have done, is reinvest in their own players and take that extra cap room and put it into their guys. So, um, yeah, I, I, it's, it, this one's going to be interesting. And do they, just, do they let them play on the 19-2? Do they just take yeah. them back on the one-year deal? Yeah, I mean he's a good corner. Uh, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't mind letting him play on that deal if I were them. But if you can also find a suitor that you're going to get some draft pick compensation back, that also works as well as they've done a tremendous job drafting on that secondary. I mean Trent McDuffie might be the best slot corner in the NFL with what he's able to do. He was outstanding in the playoffs this past season. Uh, last news and note here from around the NFL. This is interesting. The Cleveland Browns have hired uh, former head coach Mike Vrabel to be a consultant. Uh, what's behind this move here for Cleveland? I think it's really fascinating. We don't really see this too often from teams. Mo- most often the consultants are no. in the front office. It's, all right, they're going to consult like Rick Spielman in Washington or stuff like that. But this is Vrabel who was just coaching last year now helping out Kevin Stefanski and that coaching staff. Well, I think it's. I, I don't. Th- I don't think he's going to be in the building. When I heard the word consultant, I think he's going to be a direct. He's going to help. I'm sure D. Podesto. He's going to help Andrew Barry, and he's going to help Kevin Stefanski transition from a play caller into a head coach, right? Mm-hmm. And so, I think this is a really smart move by the Browns because you get a guy who's an experienced head coach who wasn't calling the defense, who wasn't calling the offense or the kicking game to kind of help Kevin, you know, learn how to become a head coach and not a play caller. And I think this is a huge step for him in terms of the educational process. And it shows a lot about Kevin's ego. Most coaches Mm -hmm. would feel threatened by this, right? Oh, he's going to come in and replace me. But I think to me, doing this, it's just more brain power at a position where you kind of need someone to help it. It's one of the biggest downfalls in the National Football League. I keep asking the question, who's helping the head coach? Yep. Who's helping him? And the answer is in Cleveland, Vrabel. I think it's an outstanding decision, you know? I mean, because if you want to, it, it, he's going to teach you his methodology of how he approaches the game and how he approaches the opponent and how he approaches the team. That's vital information. And for Mike, it keeps him active in the game and it gives him a purpose to understand that, hey, I got to work every day for a team, not just I'm looking over the whole league. Yeah, it keeps him dialed in there for eventually, I'm assuming, uh, a job that he will go get in, uh, after the 2024 season. And if you want Vrabel's resume, it speaks for itself of what he's able to do. This is the same guy that went into Arrowhead Stadium with Malik Willis at quarterback and forced overtime. Like, like, like that tells you what yeah. Mike Vrabel can do as a head down. coach. <laughs> yeah, one of the great coaching yeah, jobs. And didn't get a first down for three quarters, yeah. <laughs> and they were able to get to OT. It's remarkable stuff. Cleveland, though, is interesting. They're 6-1 to one at our show sponsor, DraftKings, to win the division. The North is obviously difficult. Baltimore is up there, a contender once again. Cincinnati now with Joe Burrow back. They're a contender at plus 165. But the Browns are at plus 600 to win that division. And that's still a really, really talented roster. But it all comes back to number four, the quarterback, Deshaun Watson. Can they get him to sort of play at that high level if they can I think this team can go toe-to-toe with Cleveland and Cincinnati what's the hidden message though Femi behind you know they love Thompson Robinson last year they traded away 
you know, a, 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 a the backup quarterback so that the, the Robinson could be Thompson Robinson could be the backup. Mm-hmm. And then they signed Jameis on a one year, four million dollar fully guaranteed deal. They have DTR there. And then they go ahead and sign Pro Bowler Tyler Huntley yeah. to as the third. Like what is going on there? Like to me, now you've got four. Are you going to trade Thompson Robinson if he has any value, which is not very much for a guy that was picked in the fifth round? So are you giving up on that? Winston's a one and done, right? Mm-hmm. I don't know the level of how many years they got for Huntley, but it tells I mean, me it's a that, one you know, A, they don't want to get caught with their pants down again like they did last year, counting on Thompson Robinson in case Watson gets hurt. Or are they saying Watson is 100% healthy? Like there's more here that makes you ask the question, what's going on? And it isn't like depth. Like typically teams don't have four quarterbacks that on their roster where two of them are getting guaranteed money besides the starter. To me. Right? I mean, yeah. you know, if you have a young one, right? If you have a – I bet you that if they had a young one, you could – you know, he's going to be the third and you have the veteran going through. Now we're okay. But now you got four. And Huntley had to been told something to sign there. Huntley had to been told something because I don't think Huntley wants to go from being the backup to Lamar to being a four-string quarterback or a third-string quarterback. So what was being said there? Like there's more here than meets the eye. And I don't know what it is. I really don't. But I'm going to find out. Like it doesn't make any sense to me to t- do this because it has to make sense. It's one of those mm-hmm. things that makes no sense on the outside but it's, it, I'm sure it makes sense to the people who made the decision. 100%. I think you put that really well there because to me, and not to speculate or anything like that, I have no inside information. But on the surface, it feels like maybe Watson's rehab is a little bit further along than they anticipated. That, that's, that's, where, or, that's what or, I would draw or maybe from they that. think, Or maybe there's still some civil suits pending. Maybe he's got something else coming down the road. I don't know. I don't want to judge. I'm not, I'm not implying anything. But to me, there's, there is, there's troops amassing at the border, and I'm not saying there's going to be a war, but what are they doing there, right? Yeah. What are they doing there? Like, why do you have four and you got guaranteed three of them? And why would Tyler Huntley give up his chance to be Lamar's backup where he played and go back and keep in the same system and do it when – he does it now he's going to go and be a fourth string or a third stringer it doesn't make sense Mm -hmm. so that to me is really something worth watching because they have an answer for it i don't but that's confidential whatever their answer is they're going to say well we just wanted to complete the depth (laughs) no 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 nobody has four quarterbacks on the team no nobody does that yeah, they're they're gearing up for something is what it seems like on the on the outside but maybe yeah maybe we'll find out in, in the next in the coming months as we get closer to the OTAs and of course training camp which is right around the corner in July I, I say right around the corner because four months are going to fly by we're going to be right back into the thick of this thing baby and I can't wait yeah. for it but that does it for this edition of the GM Shuffle podcast thank you to our producer Elliot Bowman with us as always on the ones and twos thank you to everybody that has subscribed rated and reviewed if you have not do it go ahead and do that right now uh, we appreciate our YouTube audience as well we always get great comments from the YouTube videos on the DraftKings YouTube feed so keep commenting Keep sharing those videos. We appreciate all the support here as we are now thinking to the offseason. And draft season's here, baby. The, 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 the pro days, we got Caleb Williams pro day on Wednesday. We got lying season, thick of it. Four quarterbacks in the first six picks, Michael. Could be excited. And you got your brackets to fill out. And you, <laughs> and we and got, you got your brackets to fill out. And we got brackets. Out. And we got brackets to distract us with college hoops and all of that stuff. So it's going to be a whole lot of fun over these next few weeks here. But uh, we will say so long. We'll talk to you guys on Thursday. The brackets will be, we'll be, we'll be off and running with the tournament. But we'll discuss everything that happens around the National Football League on Thursday as well. Be well until that point. We'll see you guys then.